Peter, thank you very much for that warm introduction and bringing me back to my college years. It's uh, 25 years for me uh, next year since uh, I graduated, so it's been a quarter century of being a vegan for me, and I'm still alive, right? <laughs> I'm 72 years old, I'm feeling really good, <laughs> feeling really good. And um, I'm really glad to be here in the Northwest, uh, and those of you from Oregon, great to see all of you, or those of you from Washington or other parts uh, not far away. I have been involved in campaigns in the Northwest uh, really since the early 1990s, and uh, it's been amazing for me to see just the incredible uh, number of, of vegan restaurants or vegetarian restaurants, health food stores that accommodate these concerns, restaurants that accommodate these concerns. And for those of you who don't think things are changing, uh, or if you're frustrated by the pace of change, which all of us are, know that in these 25 years where I've really been immersed, I mean, the world is really different. And we are ascendant as a movement. And the awareness and the consciousness, while nowhere, you know, it should be, uh, is so much greater than it ever has been. And I think we're building uh, every day. And, you know, I wrote this book called The Bond, um, which I'll be out at the table afterwards uh, if you, if you want to come by and, and chat and say hello. But I wrote this book because I felt a kinship with animals from my youngest days. I have three older siblings, they're all considerably older, and uh, my two parents, and because my siblings were older, they were always telling me what to do. It kind of felt like I had five parents. Um, but one area where they didn't need to give me any guidance or inculcation was about how to care for animals. I had a love and passion for animals that was built into me. It was part of my social outlook. It was just part of who I was. I didn't need to read a philosophy book or have someone tell me to be kind to animals because I just saw other animals as these other breathing, living, feeling creatures that were different from me, but they were different in good ways. They had beautiful fur, they had beautiful eyes, they ran fast. The differences were not disqualifying, which is how we so often have treated you know, animal issues as a broader society that, well, they're different, therefore we don't have to care for them. I thought the differences kind of augmented them in my eyes. It made me all the more attentive to their interests. And as I got older, I just never had that feeling drummed out of me. And I realized as I got older that I also wasn't alone in having this kinship or connection with other creatures. I mean, how many of you from your youngest days, from the ages of three or four, felt a real kinship with other creatures? And you know, I, I think that whether you go to a, 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 an event like this, where obviously we're drawn here because of a special sensitivity, but if you go really anywhere, kids are connected to animals. And this gives us a head start in doing the right thing for the creatures. Now, it's hardly the final word. We've got to act on this, and we've got to develop this sensibility. But one of the incredible things is, you know, we don't have to invent it. It exists within us. Now, as I got older, you know, I thought everybody, you know, really did love animals like I did, but then I began to see what was going on. I learned about euthanasia that was going on, of dogs and cats in our communities. I learned about puppy mills. I learned about the killing of seals in Canada. I learned about captive hunts when I was a kid. And I learned about, you know, factory farming. And I learned about so many other issues. And I was struck at a very young age, you know, in my teens, by this incredible set of contradictions that exists in society. I mean, we're a nation, and you know, and this is true in so many other parts of the world, that expresses a love for animals. I mean, you can hardly find anybody now today who says, I don't love animals, or who says that cruelty to animals is acceptable. And of course, we have 50 state laws 
that forbid animal cruelty. And it's a felony in 47 states. Just a few months ago, we got Mississippi to be the 47th state to treat vicious and malicious acts of cruelty as a felony. If you look at particular practices like dog fighting, that's a felony in all 50 states. Cockfighting is outlawed in all 50 states. The legal framework exists that acknowledges that we have responsibilities to at least some animals and that cruelty to animals is wrong. And then you look more broadly and you see we have all of these expressions of this bond and this kinship with other creatures. We have 171 million dogs and cats in our homes. Two thirds of American households have pets. We spend more than $50 billion a year on them. So it's really the unusual home that doesn't have some furry creature running around the house or standing on the kitchen table every once in a while, sleeping in the bed. <laughs> you know, if you are doting and loving on your companion animals, you are absolutely part of the mainstream. There are 70 million of us minimum who are active wildlife watchers. We go out into the forests and the fields to see the other creatures who share this planet with us, whether it's ducks or doves or deer or, you know, if we're lucky enough to see a bear or some other creature. I mean, we spend another $50 billion a year watching the incredible feats of flight of birds or seeing the mammals in their native habitats. You know, in coastal communities, you know, kind of like this one, there are whale watching enterprises. That alone is a $2 billion industry globally a year, and there are 80 nations of the world involved in whale watching enterprises. I mean, you look at all the different expressions and manifestations of love and appreciation for animals, it's all around us. We have a 24-hour channel, Animal Planet, that's all about humans and animals. We've got nature programming on Nat Geo and Discovery. Go to any bookstore, there's a section on nature and pets. I mean, look at all of the different manifestations and expressions of our relationship with other creatures, and you see so much to the good. Yet, in our very same culture, which is the incredible aspect of this relationship that we have with animals, is we have so much cruelty. And so much of it, it, so much of it is occurring in institutionalized ways. It's factory farming, where, as you know, 10 billion animals are used for food every year in the United States, or killed for food in the United States every year. More animals go through slaughterhouse lines in the United States than there are people on the planet. I mean, we have tens of millions of animals used in animal testing and education and uh, research. We have 120 million animals shot for sport. We have millions killed for the fur trade. We stage fights between animals. We use them in rodeos. And on and on and on. I could regale you with more of this information from my perch at the Humane Society of the United States. Of course, the flip side of that is we also have now 10,000, more than 10,000, organizations devoted to animal protection. And kind of every animal has somebody or some organization thinking about him or her. I mean, of course, we have 3,500 brick and mortar animal shelters, mainly focused on dogs and cats in this country. There are another 6,000 or so rescue groups. There are feral cat organizations that are doing trap, neuter, and return, and uh, sterilizing. Uh, cats to limit their numbers so they don't have to be euthanized. There are breed rescue groups, everything from Chihuahua Rescue to St. Bernard Rescue and everybody in between. There are rescue groups for every kind of animal. I opened my book, The Bond, talking about folks in Southern California who do hummingbird rescue, taking these tiny little creatures, using a little dropper and feeding them, you know, every hour on the hour to give these creatures some hope and to give them some comfort and compassion. And there are groups that protect guinea pigs or guinea pig rescue groups. There's everything under the sun. We support a rabbit sanctuary in South Carolina uh, for injured and homeless rabbits. And our motto is we provide uh, hope for the hopeless. And um, <laughs> you know, this is the, 
incredible thing. I mean, there are groups on uh, every wildlife species. There's a mountain lion foundation. There's a snow leopard foundation. Every animal has somebody thinking about them. Yet the question is, why do we need 10,000 organizations devoted to helping animals in need? Why are so many animals in crisis? And this is the, really the central contradiction that exists in our relationship with other creatures. And it's the central task that occupies you know, my life and the work of the Humane Society of the United States and so many other organizations devoted to this mission of caring for animals, respect for animals, compassion for them. You know, the central problem in the relationship that we have with animals is that we have all the power in the relationship. There's an incredible asymmetry in the power. We hold all the cards. You look back historically to the settlement and expansion of our nation, go to the middle of the 19th century when we were moving out uh, west in our westward expansion, you know, toward the Pacific Northwest, you know, perhaps plying the Oregon Trail. And the settlers and our government and the army that was, you know, working to vanquish the Native American populations. They were killing off the buffalo. Uh, we started to shoot and kill passenger pigeons mainly for cheap meat in the newly emerging cities of the 19th century. There were 40 to 60 million bison or buffalo that roamed the midsection of the North American continent in the early to mid part of the 20th century. And in the span of three decades after we developed the repeating firearm, the transcontinental railroad, we reduced their numbers to just 500 individuals. 500. So we developed markets in their hides and their tongues, and we began to connect those rural areas to the urban areas and the emerging demand for animal products in those communities. And it was a destruction. And it was unhindered you know, by any organization that existed or any kind of ethical framework that gave us guidance in terms of conservation or animal protection. Passenger pigeons, there were billions of passenger pigeons that flew in flocks, you know, over vast stretches of the United States. Billions of them. And in the span of just a few decades, again, we just about exterminated them. And then in the 20th century, we did finally finish them off. There were flocks that would pass over a single point. It would spend, they would spend hours flying over that single point. In the middle of the day, on a bright blue day, sun shining, it would be dark because the flocks were so big and they were, they were clustered together uh, so densely. So that was then, 150 years ago. Imagine now with all of the advantages that we have over animals. I mean, we can manipulate them genetically. We have all sorts of technologies to allow us to exploit animals in rapid fashion. So the advantages have never been more great than they are now. And how we handle this awesome power that we have is a test of our humanity. Do we choose the path of harm and exploitation and killing because we have that power? Or do we choose to act with mercy and decency in limiting our power and showing restraint in the face of opportunity? Especially now with the availability of so many alternatives in so many realms. I mean, do we really need to engage in dogfighting when we have thousands of forms of entertainment? I mean, we recognize just about all of us as a society that using dogs in staged fights where they bite each other and try to kill each other and do kill each other just for human amusement, whether it's just the titillation of seeing these animals in battle or it is the gambling on the outcome. I mean, we now recognize as a society that the weighting of these interests, that the harm and suffering that the animals endure is more important to us than this replaceable form of recreation and amusement 
And we say in our society, there's got to be a balancing of these interests. And we've got to say, in this case, this is wrong. We're a civil society. We've got to forbid this conduct. That's an easy moral question for us because the alternatives are so obvious and the abuse is so acute. But we look in so many different realms in this day and age and we find that we have alternatives now that don't require us for our survival or well-being or even you know, having an incredible quality of life to do these things to animals. We've got options that abound. You know, I talk in the book about going up to the ice flows of Canada. And this is in the 1980s. I first went up to see the incredible migration of harp seals and hooded seals. There are six million seals who come down from the North Atlantic, from Greenland and other parts of the North, Atl North Atlantic. They come down the eastern seaboard of Canada, down the long, craggy coast of Quebec, to Labrador and to Newfoundland and Prince Edward Island. The mothers with their full bellies pregnant with the uh, pups soon to be born. And they go to these vast ice sheets to the east of the North American continent, south of where polar bears are where there are no natural predators, non-human predators who can get to them. And when I first went there, I flew in, a, in an aircraft into Prince Edward Island and then took a helicopter out over the ice flows. We were flying about 15 or 20 minutes before we saw the first couple little specks on the ice and those were the first seals. Then we flew five or 10 minutes out more. We saw a few more specks and then another five or 10 minutes we saw lots and lots of specks. And then we landed the aircraft um, on the ice hoping that it was a thick patch of ice. <laughs> and all around me when I stepped out in this lunar looking landscape were these beautiful mothers with their gray coats and silvery flecks on it. And each of them was with a beautiful white coated baby seal, fluffy seal with black eyes. And, you know, I would have paid anything to see this. I mean, it was a miracle of nature. It's a nursery of the North. And it's like when people go to the Serengeti or other parts of East Africa to see the great migrations of the wildebeest and the zebras and the giraffes and the buffalo and the other animals that constitute that migration. Well, this was the marine mammal equivalent. And seeing these animals on the ice in this landscape where the sun was refracting off the ice and it was a kaleidoscope of colors and you see these innocent, beautiful creatures. I felt, for me, it was the experience of a lifetime. And then later on, I went up to those ice flows and had you know, a similar experience of seeing the animals, but I also saw the men coming in their boats. Uh, you know, boats filled with men with clubs and guns and an intention in their heart to kill these animals because it's been going on for such a long time. And they kill these babies, they leave the mothers alone because the mother's fur is not of any value but just the babies, and they lay waste to these helpless creatures. Now, you can't think of an animal who's more helpless than one of these babies because they, they come, the men come just after the mothers have left. The mothers are with the babies for just 12 days. They produce a high-fat, nutrient-rich milk, and the babies drink it up, and then the mother, with her flippers, drags herself off to the end of the ice and slips into the water and she's gone and the baby's all alone. And the baby can't swim because she's not well developed enough and she doesn't have legs to begin with. So she can just pull herself a couple feet here or there. And the men come and, you know, at the high point of this a few years ago, they were killing 400,000 of these babies in the spring. And, you know, you, you just think of this incredible spectacle of beauty and then you think of these people laying waste, it really is similar to, must, to what must have happened in the 1850s or 1860s or 1870 with the buffalo. It's a commercially driven hunt. They kill the animal, they peel the skin off, they leave the carcass to rot on the ice or they throw it in the water. It is just a, a kill and grab and run enterprise. 
just valuing nature and animals as just a set of instrumentalities or resources or objects or things. And you know, I, I, I vowed to work with my colleagues to stop it. And you know, it just struck me of the utter uselessness of it. And you know, we've been closing markets for these seal pelts all over the world. Mexico, Canada, the United States hasn't allowed it. We stopped the European Union, all 27 member nations, three years ago from uh, having imports of these seal pelts coming in. The pelt prices have been dropping because no one, you know, in the civilized part of the world wants to wear the fur of these baby seals. And the values have gone down and that has diminished the incentive for the hunters to go out and kill them because it costs money with the boats that are breaking through this ice and the fuel costs and the perils of it. They've got to get some return and if there's no return they're not going to do it. So the kill when we started this was about 400,000. This last year was 38,000 so we've reduced it by 85%. But we don't need to kill these animals for their fur. You know, you go to any department store. You can get a beautiful cloth coat. You can now get faux fur coats that are functionally equivalent. Sometimes you can't even distinguish the fake fur from the real fur. Sometimes with the real fur, they shear it and they dye it. It looks like a fake fur in some ways. But now the fake fur can look plush and beautiful like the animal's real fur. You know, so if you take the cloth coat or the fake fur off of the rack at a store, there is no difference. There's no difference for you in terms of your quality of life in choosing the less harmful option. You can have the same warmth, you can have the same style, and you can have it without taking the lives of 20 or 30 animals. It is a simple moral choice for us. And the only thing that would allow us to do it, you know, to, to, to wear a fur is just a complete lack of awareness about what's going on or just a failure to live one's life with some basic level of moral consistency. And you know, you look at the food issue these days. And you know, I, I think of so many of these creatures. I've been to so many factory farms. I've been to egg laying facilities. I've been to slaughterhouses. And you know, I think of the turkey, for instance, as kind of a great American bird. You know, wild turkeys are fast flying. They're alert. They roost in trees. I'm sure some of you have seen wild turkeys in your uh, daily experience. And you know, contrast the wild turkey with the modern turkey used in industrial agriculture. We've genetically selected through breeding for birds that have enormous breasts and muscle mass. So much so that the birds often cannot stand on their legs. They're almost entirely sedentary. Some of them have heart attacks at three weeks or four weeks of age. Now we think of heart disease as something that afflicts, you know, a biological system, you know, in the middle portion or more likely the latter portion of life. These are not even juveniles. These are babies who are having heart attacks because we've engineered them to suit the designs of the factory farm. Where production and, you know, use of animals as economic instrumentalities has been the driver. And we've forgotten about the rest of our values. We've forgotten about our animal protection values. And with a lot of these factory farms, we've forgotten about our environmental values because we're aggregating so many animals into a single place that they're producing enormous amounts of waste that's untreated. You know, we have 310 million people in America, and just about all of our waste is treated. The 10 billion animals who are raised for food, their waste is not treated. And because we've had such a concentration of agriculture with pigs and on enormous factory farms or turkeys or chickens or others, we're creating a toxic brew in a lot of these communities because the land, the water systems cannot absorb that much. But anyway, back on the, on, the, on the turkey, I think of how we have so changed this animal. And then, you know, how we 
then have moved animals from outdoor settings. You know, before 1960, just about all the animals who were raised for food in America were in extensive systems. I mean, the animals were walking around, they had access to pasture. There were farmers who, yes, they were killing the animals. But for a lot of them, they just had one bad day. They didn't have a lifetime of misery and privation leading up to that one bad day. And we began, starting really around 1960, to adopt this industrial model and apply it to agriculture. And we changed them genetically to suit the designs of the farm. And we began to cram them into big warehouses. And for some of the animals, like pigs and chickens and turkeys and laying hens, we then began to confine you know, some of them into you know, cages or crates barely larger than the animals' bodies, like laying hens. You know, and some of you have been involved in a campaign here in Oregon on this issue. Laying hens typically now live in battery cages. There are about 280 million laying hens in the United States. And each of them is producing about six eggs a week. So we've engineered them to ovulate just about every day. That's not their natural cycle in terms of reproduction. So it taxes their system to produce an egg six of seven days. And then we put them in a small cage called a, bat a battery cage and have six or eight birds in the cage. And under the industry standard, each bird gets 67 square inches of space. Now, this is an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. Eight and a half times 11 is 93 square inches. So 67 square inches, about two thirds of this page, that's the living space that the laying hen has for the year and a half that she's alive before she's no longer reproductively capable and then she's considered a spent hen and is then sent to slaughter to go to a mink farm or to go into some feed or you know, some use. Now are we really, as a nation, are we this miserly are we this uncreative that we cannot give animals more than this allotment of space if they're going to make this sacrifice for human consumption? And you know, as I say, you know, we have so many alternatives these days. I mean, we know if you heard Dr. Bernard or if you have read books on the subject, we're healthier when we eat lower on the food chain. It's better for our hearts. The incidence of cancer is reduced. We can shed weight more readily. We have an abundance of options and alternatives in this day and age. And we're putting animals through this kind of misery and privation for it. You know, one of the central theses in my, in my book in addition to arguing that we do have a bond that's built into every one of us, is that you know, we're a great nation with a, you know, with a great history. But we haven't always been perfect in our conduct. But one of the great things about our country is that we've tried to marry economic activity and commerce with our values. I mean, when you marry them, that's when you get a civil society when business operates by ethical principles. I mean, we don't leave our principles at the door when we go to work. I mean, we're supposed to live these values of concern for others, concern for the environment, all of our different values. We're supposed to live them every day in all sorts of settings. You know, we've got a, an American constitution, and before that we had our Declaration of Independence, now, these are important documents that talk about liberty. They also talk about justice and fairness in terms of the exchange of ideas, free speech. These are not just abs abstract principles. These are the principles that have governed our society for more than 200 years. But we haven't always lived up to these principles, have we? I mean, the Declaration of Independence talks about justice, but we had chattel slavery in America. And it took us eight decades after the founding of the nation to finally abolish slavery. It took a great civil war. 600,000 people died directly in that war. 
But it was something that had to be done because you know, we couldn't have chattel slavery in a nation that talks about these principles. There had to be a reckoning. It would have been great to do it without violence. We've had other big social battles where we've had to sync up our values with our behavior, with our commerce, with our political institutions. We had child labor in this country. We had to rid the nation of that to the greatest extent possible. We talked about democracy in terms of a form of governing, but we disenfranchised women for 15 decades after the founding of the country. It took us until 1920 before we finally provided for women's suffrage in the United States. Fortunately, it didn't take a war to do it. It was an amendment to the Constitution. So we've had all sorts of problems. We had the internment of Japanese Americans around World War II. I mean, we've had a lot of things that have happened in this country that have been really inconsistent with our, with our moral principles, whether they were our religious values or whether they were our secular values. And in the moral progress of this nation and with all that we've seen in terms of how our society has progressed, it is time for us to grapple in a very fundamental way with our relationship with animals. We know too much about them at this point. We know too much about them in terms of their cognition, their emotions, their feelings, their capacity to suffer. You know, 25 or 30 years ago, a lot of people were still deniers about animal intelligence. And even some people denied that they felt pain. Now, almost nobody takes that position. And those of you who have dogs or cats in your home, you know that they have choice in their life. They make all sorts of you know, deliberate decisions. They make conscious decisions. Animals are not just biological machines programmed by evolution in some never-ending quest for reproductive opportunities or food gathering opportunities. They are living, thinking beings. They exhibit choice every day in their lives. They have the same spark of life that we have. They have the same will to live that we have. They want to avoid pain and suffering just like we do. And if we accept that basic set of principles, which are common sense principles validated by so much science, and if we accept the idea that cruelty to animals is wrong, that there is a moral problem with animal cruelty, then we've got a duty not just to look at random acts of cruelty like dog fighting or even seal killing, but we've got to look at the full range of human interactions with animals and find a way to live our lives without leaving a trail of animal victims in the process. And now in 2011, we can absolutely do it because alternatives abound for us, whether it's recreation or clothing or food or whatever it may be, we have options. And it is so much easier than ever to do it. And it's not just a, you know, a fond feeling. It's not just a personal issue. This is a political problem that we are misusing our power with animals and causing them so much pain and suffering just because we can do it. You know, I've got a lot of characters in my book. And one character is a guy named Chuck Anderson. And he was out swimming a few years ago in the Gulf of Mexico. And before he knew it, a bull shark was right on top of him and bit him in the hand and severed four of his fingers. And shark made another run at him. He parried the blow. Shark made a third run at him. And this time, the shark got him even worse than the first bite, severed his arm just below the elbow. Chuck had two grievous wounds. and did his best to struggle to shore. People were there, saw how terribly he was injured, knew what they were doing, slowed his blood loss. Emergency personnel responded, and uh, Chuck survived, but forever changed by that experience. Now, you would think a person who had that sort of bitter experience with an animal 
would at least emotionally have plenty of reason to be angry, to have hate for that creature, maybe even the entire species. I mean, intellectually it may not make much sense, but emotionally it makes powerful sense to all of us. But the incredible thing about Chuck Anderson is that he found deep within himself the grace and the goodness and the decency to find another way. And a couple years ago, he and seven other victims of shark attacks went to Capitol Hill not to advocate for a defunding of our marine animal protection laws, not to say that the endangered sharks that were on our endangered species list should be removed, but to go there to lobby for legislation to stop the practice of shark finning, where sharks are hauled onto a boat, have their dorsal fin or other fins cut off, and typically the living animal mutilated is thrown back into the water to die a miserable death. And the estimate is 73 million sharks globally are killed for their fins, for shark fin soup, which is a luxury soup, if you will, that's used at weddings and other high occasions, mainly in certain Asian American cultures. Now, I'm told that shark fin itself is just about entirely bland, tasteless. We could have a thousand other ingredients in the soup and not have a diminished, you know, culinary experience. But stubborn refusal to see what's going on with these animals and a stubborn allegiance to tradition results in this incredible number of animals harmed. But the point really is, is more about, in this case, the reason I mentioned the story about a guy named, like Chuck Anderson. I mean, here is a guy who was presented, you know, with a really tough personal circumstance. And he decided, despite his bitter personal experience, to do what he could to help these creatures in need. Most of us don't have bitter experiences with animals. Most of us have had very good positive experiences with animals. That's why there's all this wildlife watching and pet keeping and all of this fascination that we have with other creatures. Animals enhance our lives. They don't take away. I mean, only in a limited number of occasions do they take away. Generally, they give. And if we've got this incredible brain, and if we've got this incredible creativity, you know, the watchword of the American experience has always been change. I mean, we have changed everything in society. I mean, you look back to 1990 or 1987 when I was graduating from college, and now, I mean, the world, we have the internet, we have global communications, our transportation systems have changed. I mean, we used to go around on horses, you know, then we developed the automobile, and we had the train, and now we have aircraft. I mean, how amazing. I mean, we don't stand in one place, but this is what our political opponents in these realms of various animal use industries want us to do. They want us to stand in place. They want us to say that using animals, you know, as we're using them now is the only way we can do it. That's our profit. That's the way we're going to continue to make money. As if we can't be adaptive and find a way for us to have a good quality of life a high standard of living, and also not make victims of these other creatures. You know, I see in my job the best of humanity, people like you, who are self-sacrificing, you devote your volunteer time, maybe even your, your entire career to this cause of helping animals. You contribute to organizations to allow them to drive this sort of change in society. I mean, we can do this. I mean, we have a society that has changed in so many ways over time. And we have the capacity to problem solve and find a way to get this done in all of these domains. So I'm ultimately, while I'm 
I see, as I said, so many great people. I also see the flip side. I see the worst of humanity. I see cruelty and callousness, probably more so than just about anybody because of my position and being at the center of a lot of these things for more than two decades. But I'm hopeful about things. I'm hopeful because I just don't see that our political adversaries have much of a leg to stand on, on these issues. They're defending something that is at odds with the moral standards of our society. And they're denying the innovation and change that is part of who we are as a nation. But no sort of big social change is self-executing. It's always required good people to stand up, to be involved politically, to be involved in the marketplace. And this is the most tangled of all the issues. I mean, we had some big, big issues that we've dealt with as a nation. But when you talk about the human relationship with animals, I mean, that's one of the most fundamental relationships that exists. And it takes us into the realms of agriculture and so many different realms of science and wildlife management and so many other arenas. It is complex. And this issue is not some far off subject. You know, a lot of us have been watching what, what's been going on in North Africa and the Middle East uh, throughout 2011 and the emergent movements to shed dictatorship and autocracy, to try to bring uh, democracy and civil society to the nations of Egypt and Tunisia and Syria and so many other nations that have been racked with this tumult. We can't really do much about it. It's far off from, from our daily existence. I mean, we can cheer on these incipient movements for democracy. But we can't, you know, we can't really be there unless maybe we're a native of those countries and we go to help. But with animal issues, my God, we have opportunities every day. And there's no issue that we have greater control of in terms of the lives and deaths of animals than the food issue. I mean, we sit down, if we're lucky enough, three times a day, and we make life or death choices for animals all the time. And it may be disconnected the actual use and production and transport and slaughter of the animals from our daily decision may be happening a thousand miles away, may be happening a hundred miles away. But morally speaking, it is as consequential as it gets. I mean, there's a reason that 10 billion animals are raised for food. It's because people are eating them and using them. And we're tolerating these production conditions for them. And you know, this is the enterprise that we're involved with at HSUS, is to think through all of these relationships and to find a better way. And even if, you know, I know a lot of you are already there as vegans or vegetarians, many of you I'm sure aren't entirely there. And for the people who are not coming here today, I mean, every little thing that we do matters for animals. You know, one of the toughest things with this issue of food is, you know, when you find a pathway and then others in your life don't, don't see it as clearly as you do, whether it's your friends or family members or others. I mean, that, is a, that was really tough for me, you know, when I was starting off. And I don't have any, you know, final answers for you on it. It's a personal issue. It's a struggle that all of us have. But I try to blend an impatience for change with a tolerance for the individual. I loved animals, as I said, right from my earliest days. I mean, when I was two or three, animals were it for me. I was drawing pictures. As I got a little older, I had all the encyclopedias, dog ear to all the animal entries. I watched Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. It was my favorite show. <laughs> and, you know, I. I wanted to do the right thing, but I didn't. It took me until I was 19 to really, you know, change my diet in a fundamental way. I mean, we all don't change at the same pace. We don't all have the same experiences. Every little thing that someone does, whether they make a 5% change or a 20% change or more, is something to be celebrated. 
Because this is not an all or nothing proposition with animals. We will never solve human caused cruelty to animals in the world. Just like we may never solve, we won't ever solve human rights problems or human on human abuses in the world. But if we can solve 10% or 30% or 70%, my God, how many billions of lives are caught up in each percent? So every little thing that we do is so critically important for these creatures. And as I said, you know, we have a bond that everybody can kind of understand about this connection with animals. And as we have all of this change that's going on in society, let's continue to show people the options and alternatives that exist and rely on the creativity of the human mind. But we also have to be involved. Don't leave it up to somebody else. Those anti-slavery crusaders, uh, the women's suffragists, and so many others were the people who changed the way that society operated. They had a vision and an ideal for a better society. And now we're at this incredible moment at the early part of the 21st century when we have so much awareness about animals. The situation is ripe for change. The exploitation is enormous, but that means there's an enormous opportunity for progress. So um, I look forward to, uh, to meeting you. I thank you for your commitment. Thanks for having me here today. But in my book, which, which we are selling out in the main hall, I touch on just about all these issues somewhere in the book. And I, uh, I do talk about a, a lot of marine mammal issues. And it was HSUS that actually filed a legal action to stop the killing of the sea lions um, in the Northwest here. And we're, yeah, we're, we're, we're committed to um, not, as you say, scapegoating the, the the sea lions. I mean, they need to eat um, fish in order to survive. And if you look at the data that show how much they eat compared to what commercial and sport fishermen are taking, plus the real problems, of course, are habitat related with the damming of the rivers causing, you know, so much of these runs to, to have been diminished through the years. Um, it really is a case of, of um, of concentrating on one easy emotional sort of problem that, that, that the wildlife managers have identified and not looking at the whole picture. So we're going to work strenuously to protect the Marine Mammal Protection Act. We're, we're opposing legislation by Representative Doc Hastings of Washington State to remove protections for the sea lions. It's, it's a struggle. I mean, it's, everything is a struggle. This is never going to be easy to do something as fundamental as we're talking about. It's one reason why I actually came to HSUS in 1994 and uh, why we've merged with a few other groups, Doris Day Animal League, the Fund for Animals, the Association of Vet Veterinarians for Animal Rights, is more than anything, I think what our movement needs is a powerful mainstream organization that can drive political change in these big domains. If you're going up against the agribusiness, you're going up against the wildlife management establishment and the NRA, you cannot bring a pea shooter to that fight. I mean, you need a powerful set of armaments in order to advocate for animals. Animals, we, we've got the arguments. We've got the logical case. I think we've got the scientific case. Now we need to follow it up with organization in the marketplace and in the political realm. And that's what we're trying to do. That's why as I travel around the country, I've been to 87 cities on my book tour, I say, you know, get involved in this enterprise because this is exactly what the animals see. We're, we're, when the crush video legislation, when we passed it in 1999, and then it was invalidated by a federal court, it went up to the US Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled adversely. The next day, we had a new, uh, finely tuned bill introduced in the Congress, and we got it through in just a few months. That's the sort of political organization that our movement needs more than anything. Yes, well, great question. I don't know if everyone can hear that. Gentleman lived in Newfoundland and 
saw firsthand the challenges that people in the community faced and how they were driven to seal killing as part of their economic uh, survival. You know, this is something that I talk about in the last chapter of the book, which is called the humane economy. I mean, we need to marry our values um, with our economic institutions. We used to be the greatest, in the sense of biggest, whaling nation in the world. I mean, we killed whales all over the globe, you know, leaving ports in Nantucket and New Bedford and other ports in the United States. And when we developed petroleum as a nation, you know, in the, or we found petroleum, then we're, we're able to use it. And then as our values kind of squared up with, with these incredible animals who live in the oceans, we said, no, we can, we can find another way. And now, as I mentioned in my, my, my comments, we have a $2 billion whale watching industry. So we've docked the whaling boats, and we now have whale watching that substitutes and is much more sustainable and lucrative. You know, seal watching should be much more lucrative. What is the pool of people interested in wearing seal pelts? I mean, it is diminishing in a world where these values are ascendant. But what is the pool of people who might love to go see these animals in the wild? I mean, the economic potential is so much greater by turning it into a, a tourist-based economy that is built around appreciation of marine mammals. That is the future. And the past is the killing of the seals. And making that transition is difficult because we can't, you know, these pieces, people are not chessboard pieces, but it's inevitable. And the faster that the communities in Newfoundland realize that, the better off they're going to be, I really believe that, as well as the, uh, as well as the marine mammals. So again, thank you all very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thanks.